can't we drive with other people and how you have you know progressed in your career uh well about my background um i was born in buenos aires and th there is a, a core value that i learned as a child uh, because I, I was poor. I mean, I, I was middle class when I was very young, but then at the age of 12, my dad lost his job. I mean, Argentina got into a big crisis. Argentina, anyway, is always in a big crisis. Uh, but that one was very hard. And we barely had money to eat. And it was pretty tough at the time. But uh, in time, it was something that I realized that really helped me because um, then I was able to adjust to any situation. I think that's something that poverty gives you. And for example, I, I always uh, dreamt of traveling. I mean, I wanted to travel so hard, but when you don't have money, it's very difficult because apart from that, I didn't want to travel in my country. I wanted to go abroad and to places like India or Egypt uh, that are very far away and very expensive, like the plane tickets. And well, but I didn't have money. So I remember that I, I was able to save like maybe $3,000 but I wanted to travel for a lot of years. So uh, I had to stay in hostels and in very cheap places, guest houses. Uh, like I stayed like three months in Pajar Ganj. And I think that uh, being poor when I was so young really helped me to adjust to that. Uh, and it was also something that gave me the experience of, I mean, I didn't know it at the time because of course, when you travel, you want to be more comfortable and maybe stay in hotels or Airb Airbnbs. But when you do so, you don't meet people and you don't live so many experiences as when you stay in hostels. So that was something that I learned as a child that really helped me in the future because thanks to that, to stay in, in hostels and places like that, I was able to experience a lot of things that I, I wouldn't have otherwise. And that was something that really helped me in my career too because thanks to that, I was able to create the videos and, you know, and people ref people felt really identified with that. Awesome, thank you very much for sharing that. I, I think, yeah, it's very, you know, interesting to hear always uh, from, you know, people that have, you know, gone through a lot. Uh, I think that's, you know, obviously uh, one of the main ways in which people can learn. So it's very interesting to, you know, hear that from you. And I think that these kind of uh, hardships uh, are what, I mean, we, we don't see it at the time because we always think, we always want it to be uh, another way. Like when I was poor, I didn't want to be poor, of course. I wanted to have money and, and all that. But then in the future, re you realize that all uh, what you've been going through is what helps you pave the way to whatever you want to do. Yeah. I don't know. Um, so now uh, I want to go into, before you start your careers as a comedian and as a you know, public figure, uh, you studied to be uh, an English teacher. Uh, can you share with us a little bit about your time studying and how, you know, what did you learn from that and um, how was your experience doing that? Well, I, I, I didn't have a vocation for that, really. I mean, I was so lost in life. I didn't know what to do. And I loved English. Uh, anyway, now it's kind of rusty because I haven't been, uh, I haven't used it for a long time. But then I got into college and I think that what I learned wasn't so much about the knowledge that I acquired, but about uh, responsibility because um, as I didn't have my, my like my parents couldn't pay for uh, college I had to pay it myself so I had to work uh, and study at the same time and then my dad got cancer it's like my dad got I mean uh, there were so so many problems uh, and he got cancer so it's like I had to deal with many things at the same time and going to college is very hard very demanding because you have to study uh, very hard and I would wake up at 7 a.m. in the morning and then I would go to bed at midnight for five years, uh, having to, to deal with, with a lot of things at the same time. It was very hard. But what I learned there was to be able to do it no matter what. Like my father was dying and at the same time I had to take exams and I had to do them because of course I could have said, OK, I will postpone them and maybe take them the next year. But I was so aware that that was my chance to you know, to be better in the future. So um, I knew that even though I was sad and I was going through something very hard, um, I had to study because eventually that would be uh, what would allow me to travel and do whatever. And that's something that really helps me nowadays too because as a comedian, I make people laugh and I'm a very nostalgic person and I'm a kind of sad person more than a happy one. And it's very difficult because I, I'm a YouTuber and also I'm a streamer on Twitch. And I, I go live like maybe three hours per day from Monday to Friday and sometimes even Saturdays and Sundays. And those three hours, I have to be happy and upbeat. I mean, I, 
of course, sometimes, I mean, if you search for my videos, some of them, I mean, I'm, I'm crying and, and I'm sharing more of my, uh, you know, personal experiences and more like intimate ones. But mostly I make people laugh. So what I learned in college was to be able to do that, even though maybe sometimes I'm going through very hard experiences. Uh, and that was, I think, the most valuable thing I learned, I learned there. Um, so as you know, we have a lot of students both here and online. Uh, so if you could go back in time, what advice would you give to your you know, 20 year old self if you were a student? So what advice would you give to yourself and to these students here? This will sound kind of cliche, but not to give up and to be very responsible with what you're doing and, and being really aware of, I mean, there will be a lot of hardships. And you know, when you study, I mean, I don't know, a lot of times you will, you will want to drop out of college, but in the future, you know, if you continue, even though it's very hard and even though whatever thing you are going through, you will be better. But you need to be strong enough to do that because you really have to be strong. I mean, a lot of people uh, just drop out because they feel so... I mean, I have a lot of colleagues of mine that maybe they just couldn't handle it. You know, there were so many things going on at the same time and life is pretty hard. And then eventually they ended up going back to college. But then maybe it took them like 10 years, something that it that for me, it was like five years of my life. I don't know, and I, I really think you, you need to find strength from within and I don't know, and just go on. Um, so now to go a little bit into your career, um, you do a little bit of everything. Uh, like we discussed, you're a comedian, uh, you're a singer, songwriter, uh, you've written books. Uh, so can you share a little bit of your creative process with us? Like how do you come up with uh, uh, like content for your shows, for your social media, for your uh, YouTube videos, and for your books and songs. Yeah, well, it's quite different depending on what we are talking about. Like, uh, as a YouTuber and streamer, I mean, I wake up very early every morning and I check websites, uh, like news websites, uh, social media. I watch, I'm watching YouTube all the time. Like, or even if I'm cleaning or if I'm doing, you know, something at, at home, like cooking or whatever, I always. Uh, play a podcast or something, I don't know. And I, I try to really listen and, you know, to take whatever sparks something inside, like I take it and, and I have like a, a WhatsApp group with myself. Like, uh, so I write ideas there because then, I mean, as I, uh, I go live like three hours per day on Twitch, I need to have topics to talk about. Like, you know, I can't always rely on my skills as an, a very good improviser. Um, and also something that for me is, is really important is to, you know, on YouTube, you don't see the comments while, while, while you're recording the video. I mean, you see the comments afterwards. So you, you don't have a feedback uh, in real time, but when you do Twitch, you do. I, I became a streamer like five months ago and I was a YouTuber like, I don't know, like seven years ago or something. So I, my, my big experience is on YouTube. And as a streamer, for me, it was very difficult to speak and look into the screen at the same time because I'm used to looking into the camera always. But as a streamer, it's so important for you to look into the screen because when you talk into the camera, people are saying things to you. There is a comment section where people are, you know, commenting all the time. And then I realized that if I look into the screen and I read what people are saying, then I can also take ideas from there because maybe someone makes a question or whatever and then I, I say it out loud and then I, I respond to it. So it's like you take creativity from everywhere, you know, but you have to really listen and to be able to do that. But of course it takes practice. I mean, at the beginning I, I wasn't able to do it. I was all the time looking into a camera and then when I read the comment section on Twitch, everybody was saying, Martin, uh, read us, read us. We, we are saying this, this and that. And maybe if I, Talk, if I'm talking like for 10 minutes straight without looking into the screen, then I lost a lot of things that I could have used. Yeah. But on YouTube and Twitch, it's mostly funny stuff, what I do. So I try to take like funny pieces of news or whatever. But then when I write music, songs, that is quite different because I try to connect with something like deeper, which is difficult for me because as a comedian, I, I mean, I all, all the time I try to make people laugh. I mean, that's like natural for me. And when I, think, okay, maybe I could talk about this deep topic, I feel stupid, like, oh, they will think, you know, I'm such a, I don't know, I'm, I'm a cliche, like, because, I don't know. But then when, when I write songs, I try to leave that aside. Anyway, I have some funny songs, uh, but I try, you know, for songs to be like a mix of both words. Then when I write books, well, anyway, I, I, I'm writing my second book and I publish a, a novel, uh, which was fiction. So for me, it was really good because when you write, 
you don't have feedback. I mean, feedback comes afterwards and the process of writing is so long. Like the first book I wrote took me like maybe one year. And it's, for me, it's a much better process and a healthier one because it maybe it takes one year to write a book, but nobody's telling you this is awful, like, or change this idea. You could write it, you don't know, in some other way. So it's pretty good because it's very like it's an, like an intimate experience. You are on your own writing, and it's pretty good. And only when I write books, I really feel free to go as deep as I want. That doesn't happen to me in music. I, like in music, I always have this battle within myself between like my funny part and my very serious and sad part. And with books, that doesn't happen to me. I think also because it's like 100% fiction, um, but. I, I could never succeed, really. My last blog was a travel blog, and it was visi visited by maybe 2,000 people per day, which is not a high number. So that, that is my, like, the main thing. I mean, I'm a writer, first of all. And then I realized that blogs were disappearing, and I thought, okay, what, what can I do? Because like, I really wanted to do something else. And then I became a YouTuber because I, I moved to Egypt, and I thought, okay, I want to tell people what it's like to live abroad. And then I became a YouTuber, which was very hard at the beginning because I was not used to being in front of a camera talking. My first videos, people say they are very fun, but for me are so awkward to see. I mean, for me, I know that people don't have that judgmental thing that I have with myself, of course. But, um, sorry, I don't remember the question. Yeah, I asked, um, how do you decide to jump into you know, uh, ah, writing yeah. and making music? Okay. So, Writing was natural for me. I mean, so I, I don't even remember uh, how I, I decided it. But YouTube was because I needed a purpose for traveling. I mean, I don't like traveling just for the sake of it. Like, I wanted to find other ways. Because I always wanted to be uh, famous or <laughs> whatever. But I mean, um, I knew that I had something to say, you know? So I just had to find a way. Writing didn't work for me because I, I tried for 10 years or so. So I thought, okay, I have to try something else apart from that because blogs are disappearing. So, you know, uh, so then I saw a lot of YouTubers, which was a concept that was so foreign for me because I, I didn't know that that even existed. We are talking 2010, 13 or so, which, I mean, YouTube was like a new thing. There were few YouTubers in the world. But then I saw some and I thought, I can do this because this may sound silly, but every time I met friends or people at college, we were in groups talking, and I, I would always start telling an anecdote that was very funny, and I loved that. And I saw that everybody was looking at me, and they were laughing, and they were like, go on, like, and, and what else, and what, what, what happened? And that was something natural. I mean, I didn't, I, I wasn't like acting or playing something uh, like a character. So then I thought, if I can do this on YouTube, and I can ma make people watch it, then everything will be all right. I know that what I do is good. I know that it sounds kind of cocky, but well, I mean, I, I really thought that way. I mean, I know I have a lot of uh, flaws, but that is like a, a strength for me. But anyway, it took me three years because YouTube at the time was for children and teenagers. There, were, th there wasn't YouTubers for adults talking about adult topics. And I was already 30 or 31, I don't remember. So, I mean, I saw some YouTubers that were maybe my age, and they were talking about, oh, how to make friends in high school. It was like, but you're 30 years old, why are you talking about that? Like, nobody cares. Nobody your age cares, I mean, because high school is so, so back. So then I thought, okay, I want to speak about other stuff. You know, I was in Egypt, and I was um, doing a lot of things. I was meeting a lot of people, and then people wouldn't believe what I was saying. Like, how can these guys living these experiences, you know? Like, I had sex with some people in Egypt, with a lot of people, actually, so I, and I recorded that experience. They're like, oh, I was with this guy, and this, this, and this happened. And it's a very different culture, like Egypt and Argentina, like, you know, it's like two different planets. Of course, people were like, what? And this happened? And the guy did, did this and did that? So um, people started to, you know, to, watch my videos but anyway it took me like three years because then I came to India I spent like I think six months here and it was something kind of similar to Egypt like I was telling uh, you know uh, uh, all my experiences then I don't know what happened but after three years I was running out of money and I decided to go back to Argentina and put on some some shows like maybe I don't know three in 
small venues, like maybe 100 people. And then I thought, okay, well, I need this in order to get money, to continue traveling, because I wanted to continue traveling. I mean, I was able to, uh, after two years of living in Egypt, I was like, okay, I don't miss my country anymore. I don't miss my family. I don't miss my friends. It's like, I know I sound like an awful person, but I can, I can have relationships through the phone, you know, through WhatsApp or whatever. And uh, as soon as I published these shows, they sold out like, I don't know, in one hour. And I thought, okay. And I published another one. And then I started to publish like, shows in other, in other cities and in other countries like uh, Uruguay. And they all sold out. So when I went back to Argentina, I did the shows. I was so nervous because for, for me it was something so new. And it was like every time I published a show, it would sold out like in five minutes. So I thought, okay. And I continue, continue, continue. And then I, I got the money I needed to continue traveling. So I went back to that life. And I remember when I was in Malaysia, I was walking on the street and I thought, what am I doing here? Because the thing is, the reason why I left my country to travel in the first place was about, uh, apart from wanting to travel, I didn't like my life. Like I was 30 years old and even though I had a degree, I, <clears throat> I already had a good job, like, you know, I rented an apartment, I had friends, I had a boyfriend and all that. But I realized that I wasn't happy, like, I didn't want that for my life. And I always tried to write without thinking, oh, this is bad, this is not funny, or this is not serious enough, this is not sad enough. I try just to write, which is very hard, you know, not all the time criticizing yourself. And then when I rehearse, then the jokes come up. I mean, that always happens. Like this joke, for example, I intended it to be 100% kind of sad and serious. And it turned out like maybe 80% funny because even though I'm telling like very traumatic experiences, but I do it in a very funny way. But that funny, that funny part came up uh, during rehearsals. Like when I'm saying the script, it's like, then I, I, I think, oh, I can, I can make a joke there, you know? And also when I'm uh, on stage, like the show you see now is not the same show when I first uh, did it, like in March. I don't know. Um, so, and I, will, and I also take inspiration from my friends or from, because of course, I mean, I write fiction, you know, so uh, some things are based on, uh, on my life, but some others are not. And really, and I take it as fiction, of course. I mean, when I say it, I say it from the character. So maybe some people think, oh, this is 100% uh, true. And it's not really, it's fiction. That's why it's so important to listen to podcasts and to be all the time uh, in contact with uh, content in general, because you take inspiration from whatever. Maybe you read an experience on the internet and you think this is so funny, but maybe the ending is not good. I mean, if this experience, this anecdote, I don't know, uh, had finished this way, it, it would be so much uh, funnier. So maybe I change it and then I tell it as if it were something that I experienced, but it's not really. Awesome. Let me change a little bit. Uh, we're going to switch topics a little. Uh, so through your career, you've uh, been an activist for a multitude of issues uh, across Latin America, but mainly in Argentina. Uh, and you focused uh, mostly on um, reproductive rights and queer rights. Uh, can, you tell, can you tell us um, a little bit about your experience doing that, what you have learned, uh, and how that has impacted your work? Well, there's always like a choice you have to make when it comes to standing up for whatever is right. Because once you do it, then you will face a lot of criticism. I mean, you will have half people supporting you and half people will not. So it's, it's very tough. For me, it wasn't so much as a decision to make because I was sure that, I mean, I always thought that when I, I don't know, became kind of famous or something, I wouldn't forget about my past and where, where I come from. And I come from poverty and I come from, you know, I, most of my friends are, are women and they all had abortions. And abortion in Argentina is legal now, but it wasn't legal two years ago. So the thing is they had to do it illegally. And if you have money, you can pay a good private doctor that will not kill you. Uh, but if you are poor, you will, you will pay someone that you don't even know if he's a real doctor or something. A lot of poor uh, women in Argentina died because of that. So for me, there wasn't so much as a choice to make. It was clearly obvious that I had to stand up for that. I mean, um, I'm gay and uh, when I said it, I was a teenager and the people that really supported me were uh, women. So this topic doesn't 
touch me in any way because I'm gay. I will never face an abortion or, or will never have a girlfriend that will want an abortion. But I knew that I had to stand up for that. But it was very tough because then, of course, I face even nowadays a lot of criticism about it. Like I'm a, I'm a serial killer of babies or something because uh, I support that. And about the LGBT community, I think something similar happens. In my case, I was born in Buenos Aires, which is a very diverse city and very progressive. So when I said I was gay, it was okay. Uh, like everybody accepted me, but Buenos Aires is not Argentina. It's only a city, it's like saying Delhi in, in India. There are many cities also and many small towns. And for me, it was kind of easy uh, to be gay. I never had a, a problem with that, but I, I'm not a supporter of, of uh, LGBT community rights because of that, but because of the people that live in small towns that, that cannot say they are gay. Because if they do it, maybe people, uh, their families will take them out of, of their home. And I think that is something that we need to normalize. Like, this is totally normal as whatever. I remember a mail that I read like a week ago of a guy saying that their parents uh, sent him to a kind of a shrink but that would transform him into straight again. Which is, imagine if you are a teenager facing that. I mean, it's like your mind just explodes because, it, because you take it as something, okay, maybe I'm sick and, that, and I need to go to a doctor to make it better. And it's really awful, it's really damaging because you're, it's your own family that is you know, t uh, sending you there. So I do it really for them because I think that once you, you achieve your dreams and you start getting money and doing what, what you want, you could just stop and do that. There are, most of people do that, you know, singers or actors, actresses, whatever, that maybe they don't, it's like they have no opinions about any topic. They just do their thing, get the money and go home. I mean, I think it's okay. I mean, I'm not saying that that's bad, but I, I don't want to be that kind of person. During your activism, have you had any, you know, particular experiences that have, uh, you know, impacted you in a particular way, um, you know, that have shaped how you do your other work or have you, you know? Well, yeah. Yeah, first of all, you you think that people are like you and and if you say your opinion, they will say theirs and that's it. But actually, that's not what happens. People can get really violent and pretty aggressive on so social media. Nowadays, it's so normal to get like a lot of criticism, but very hard, you know? Uh, and they say awful things about you. So you need to to get strong. I mean, uh, because at the beginning you you only want to help people and you say, okay, maybe I, I support this abortion thing. Uh, but then when people start attacking you, then you realize, okay, this is not, I mean, you will have to pay the, the consequences for doing that. So it's very difficult. And it's something that of course shapes uh, your work because I, at the beginning, I think I was more like spontaneous about the things I said. And now I think about them very carefully because I know that what I say, maybe I sometimes I intend something as a joke, uh, talking about you know abortion or whatever, and they take it seriously. You need to be really careful with that because your followers will know the truth, but other people will not. And if they say that, I mean, they um, change what you said into something else on TV, I mean, it's not your followers uh, watching that, that TV show. It's other people that will also, you know, maybe uh, send you a message saying, oh, you're, uh, I don't know, a baby killer or whatever. So um, that is something that really changed the way I work when I speak about those topics. And I also try to choose carefully what I say about something, because maybe before I also spoke about like different topics and then I realized that I received attacks from different areas and it's like, come on, I'm a human being, so I need to choose my battles. Uh, that's something very important, like you need to choose your battles. I mean, you kind of have like 10 different battles, you know, because it, it's, you're just a human being. And I think that when you are uh, like in, in digital platforms, it's not as when you are like a traditional famous, you know, like an actress or an actor, because they have like a whole team, but we don't have a team. Like people, YouTubers, uh, streamers or whatever, don't have a team. If you say something, you have a whole team working for you, okay, maybe you can discuss it, okay, what, what can I respond to this and that and that. But when you don't have that, it's only you. So that's why you need to choose your battles, because you cannot, uh, you cannot know what to say about 10 different things. So, I don't know. The next few years of your career, maybe like the next decade, um, I would like to be able to continue, uh, you know, being able to do what I want to do in life. I think that's the most important thing. Like before I had more uh, like 
you know, I have bigger uh, hopes for the future, like in terms of, you know, money or like uh, viewership or whatever. But now I'm more like, okay, I already have my apartment. I have like a good life. I can do whatever I want. And I think that being free in life is the most important thing you can get. I mean, it, it, you can have, you can be a millionaire or whatever, but if you're on free and if you are a slave of your job, then it doesn't really matter. So maybe you're expecting me to say something like, oh, I hope to be like, I don't know, whatever, like some, someone really big, but I, that's not really my hope. I hope to find some, I don't know if happiness, because I don't think that happiness is something that exists really, but balance, you know, because I realize that I, I achieved a lot of things, but that didn't really make me happy. And actually, up to a certain point, I realized that I was even sadder than before, you know, than, than when I lived in a $3 hostel. So uh, that's why now for me, balance is so important. You know, you've been, uh, as you talked, you've been in um, social media and content creation for a long time. Now looking to the future, how do you think the, the media is gonna change? Well, th there will be a lot of new platforms for sure. I will not be on all of them because it's like when you're a content creator, it's like, you know, you work with agencies that, you know, um, that pay you for, I don't know, for ads or whatever. And they always tell you, like, oh, you have to be on TikTok. You have to be here, here. You have to be everywhere. And for example, with TikTok, I said, no, I, I mean, I love TikTok, but for me, it's like, I mean, I, for me, it's so hard, you know, to, to make uh, those, those kind of videos. But Twitch was also something new for me and that didn't exist when I first started. Uh, and I could adjust to the platform quite well. Like I really like it because it's like, you know, live streaming, uh, I'm very good at improvising. I like talking to people, I really enjoy it. So I think there will be a lot of new platforms and the only ones that I will do for that, uh, where uh, I will be in for sure will be the ones I feel identified with and that I know I can do it, not just because, okay, I have to be here because I need to get the money that is in this platform, but because I really feel comfortable with. But I think it's something like, I mean, it's impossible to predict. Like you will see it when that happens, you will adjust eventually. So what advice would you give to, you know, any young person who's maybe thinking of becoming a writer or becoming a comedian or a content creator? You know, like, what do you think is, you know, some things that you've learned uh, through your career that you can, you know, maybe tell some people and, save them uh, from having to, you know, learn that themselves. Don't speak about abortion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, uh, no, I think that um, it would be to, to be honest with what you do. I mean, it's like, it's so easy to, uh, to follow a trend. Actually, it's the easiest thing, you know. Um, but I think that if you try to do something fake that doesn't, that is not really within you, um, there is something, it shows, like somehow, I don't know how, but it shows. Uh, and I, I try, for example, to do, I mean, at the beginning, it took me three years to become like kind of successful on YouTube. It was three years of, you know, recording three videos per week, which is very hard work. And like maybe 1000 people per week would watch me, which is actually nothing in YouTube terms. <clears throat> uh, and then I tried to, to be more family friendly. Like, okay, I'm not gonna speak so much about sex and about this, about that, because if, there are teenagers and you know young people watching youtube maybe they don't want to see this and i try to make this kind of how to make friends in college in high school you know these kind of videos which are awful like when i mean they, they are private now on my my channel like you cannot you cannot see them but but i have them so when i watch them it's like god i mean it's so awkward but i try of course because you want to be successful i mean you know and you try new stuff and it really didn't work. If you see the comments, it's like, Martin, like, don't do this. Like, <laughs> it, it, I don't know, it's so awkward. And only by being honest with what I wanted to express and, when, what, and w with what I wanted to tell people, uh, it was w when I became uh, kind of su successful, you know? Maybe it takes more time. For sure it will take more time. I mean, uh, even so, if it's not the trend, you know? But I think it's the only way. And I think that the advice I would give is like, to be honest with yourself, with what you want to do, and you know, and try to anyway, uh, like get some space uh, for yourself, and not and not become your life uh, into, um, I mean, sorry, your job into your life. Yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. Uh, I think, and that applies to you know anything uh, you do in life. Like it doesn't need to be you know content creation. Yeah, but because the thing is that 
I mean, everybody wa wants to be like self-employed, you know, and wants to be successful uh, in something like they do and not being part of a company or an employee or whatever. Well, I mean, we all want to be employers and, you know, the, like the big names. But the thing is, like the tricky part is that when you become that, when you're like your own boss, you have to work so much harder. I mean, because maybe in Argentina, it's common to work from nine to six. So if you have a regular job, after 6 p.m., you just forget about it and you do your thing. You know, you go to a gym, you meet your friends or whatever. But when, when you are self-employed, when you do what you want to do and you get money from that and you don't have a boss because you are the boss, uh, you don't have the time for that. You work from, you know, 24 hours a day. So that's why it's so important to say, to, uh, you know, like, like now, for example, I'm trying to leave my mornings kind of free just to clean which is so basic, but I like cleaning and maybe I listen to music and it's a time when, you know, when I'm with myself and I need that now, like before I was all the time working, working, and then I realized like, what for? I mean, like now I have my apartment, I can do whatever I want, I can travel, uh, I'm okay. Like I don't need to be on survival mode as I was before. I think that also has to do with the fact that I was poor. Like my psychology always tell me that uh, like you are not the poor kid of Parque Patricios, which is a neighborhood in Buenos Aires. Uh, you are not that kid anymore. Like, stop thinking as if you were that poor kid. Uh, and I think that's very important. So throughout your career, uh, what are the things that motivate you to keep you know, working every day? Um, I was thinking of money. But yeah, well, money, of course, is a, yeah, well, yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna lie. But no, it's not, it's not the main part. Like, um, talking to people and the, I think that the, the connection that I built with them uh, is very important and sometimes I don't realize maybe I, I make it just a funny video but then I, I get an email of someone saying that I helped them uh, going through you know a very hard time in their lives or maybe they wanted I remember uh, when I got out of a theater um, in Argentina and a girl was crying and she hugged me and she told me that I saved her from committing suicide because she was going through a really hard time. Uh, and thanks to my videos that she would wait, uh, you know, every, every night uh, to see my videos. So, and that would keep her like, you know, from committing suicide. So, I mean, it's something that, you know, it really moves you. It's impossible to be like, uh, I don't know. And I get a lot of stories like that. And now that I've, I let my kind of serious part show because before it was like 100% funny, uh, I get more emails like that, like, thanks for sharing this, thanks for sharing that your life is also bad sometimes and that you have like very serious problems. Because sometimes when you show like you're only happy and you know, you're all the time like make, making people laugh, of course we all know that, like rationally, we all know that, that life is not only happiness, but when you only show that part, it looks like it is, and at least in your case. And if you are, you know, uh, like watching that, uh, and you're sad, you think, okay, there's something wrong with me because how, how can this guy be all the time happy and I'm all the time sad? So I think that's why it's really important also to show that part. And I think that that's a, a big motivation. Like now I'm doing some like serious interviews with people that face like, you know, hardships, like, you know, like raped or whatever, like, I mean, really awful stuff. And it's something so new for me. And I was so scared because it's like, God, you know, I have these uh, people will not accept it or whatever but they are so good with that content. And I get a lot of emails saying that, thank you for sharing these, these stories because it's like few people are talking about it, you know? Do you have any uh, last word of advice for all of our young delegates in the audience? Uh, what would you like to share? Well, I gave a lot of advice. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Be honest and don't talk about abortion. Okay. Uh, so we're gonna jump into uh, some questions now um, uh, in the back. Hi, I'm John. Um, actually, I'm very interested in the history of Argentine um, politics. I was wondering, with, with Peronism in, in, uh, Argent, um, Argent, uh, in Argentine politics, you have like kind of right-wing Peronism and then left-wing Peronism and then centrist Peronism, and it's very different than like the U.S. or European politics. So I was wondering, how does Peronism affect the daily life of, of people like you who are activists, or is there like some kind of impact that uh, Peronism has on your work in, in the field of activism? What a question. Well, per Peronism is like, it's Argentina. I don't know, it's, uh, yeah. Um, well, actually they, they, well, 
a, a sector of per because Peronism can be defined like as Peronism. It's like as you said, they are leftists and. Um, there's a sector of parents in that, for example, supported uh, abortion, and there, is, there was another one that didn't. Um, and it's, it's very difficult. That's why I was saying that you have to be very careful when you speak about politics, because in countries, I think in the US, it's not that, well, I don't know if you, I think you, you will face some consequences if you say like your point of view. Like I remember Taylor Swift, I saw the documentary on Netflix that when she said that she supported I don't remember who, like she faced a lot of backlash for that. But in Argentina, I think it's even worse. Like it's really bad. Like you have to be really careful. Like now, for example, I'm really careful about that because uh, I don't know, they can start saying like awful things about you and they start attacking you on Twitter and they make you like number one trend, you know? And it's like, God, you know, I don't receive money from any government or any whatever. Like I, I just try to, to create a, like a positive impact uh, but if by doing so, they will destroy me, well, that's why I was talking about choosing your battles. You know, you cannot, all, you cannot have 10 battles at the same time. And I say, okay, I think about this topic, about this, this, and this, and that, because it will, it, it can backfire, you know, and it can get pretty, pretty nasty. And it's me on my own. I, I don't have a whole team or whatever uh, to protect me or to advise me or, so that's why I, I don't know. It's, it's, pretty, it's a very complicated country when it comes to politics. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Uh, you mean pop culture, like the YouTube, like you mean the, the topics that are being discussed? Yeah, yeah, the trends of what kind, what sort of content is more prevalent in Latin America? It's all the opposite side to India, and not many of us are aware of it. Okay. Well, there are a lot of people talking about sex, um, like a lot of women and men, yeah, sharing their experiences. Like, oh, I have a date with this guy, and it, you know, like getting into like really like uh, details, you know. Um, so that's like. Uh, but I can say I was the first one to do it. <laughs> um, there is something, I don't know if, this, if the same is going on here, but uh, like there is this thing like YouTube versus uh, TV in Argentina. So YouTubers criticize all the time the TV saying oh, they, they are awful, like, um, I don't know, journalists that maybe get money to, you know, to have a certain opinion, uh, like about politics, as you said. Uh, of course, I can speak more about my country you know than latin america but i think it's kind of similar they are talking about that um and i don't know and gameplays well i think that that's the same in india gameplays are like worldwide um yeah well now there are some like travel bloggers that before can, kind of didn't exist yeah in the back over there yeah hi um actually uh, being a public figure right and you shared some amazing stories like uh, how you help people saving them from attempting suicide and everything but being a public figure it comes with the bad side like people are mean to you on internet and they leave rude comments so i wanted to ask how do you like how do you handle them and has it ever affected on your mental uh, like uh, mentally and how did you overcome that that's like work in progress because um Sometimes it can get really nasty, and I think what really, what, what I mean, what has really helped me is not to identify with what they are saying. That sometimes is very difficult because at the beginning you try to explain to them like I'm not this, I'm not, I'm not a baby killer, or I'm not, but then you realize, I mean, it's not worth it because I mean, I think that guy is not even thinking seriously about it. I mean, they are just saying, you know, just to like uh, to bother you. Uh, maybe some others really think of that about you, but I think that if you if you let people uh, put your value, you're done because I mean your value is something that only you can uh, you know put yourself. I don't know if that is well expressed in English. Yeah. Can you understand that? Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. Uh, so at the beginning was was very difficult to face criticism because it was like, oh, everybody hates me now, and what, what am I gonna do? My career is over, and it's always this this thing about you know going back to being the poor kid I was before, like I, I don't wanna be poor again, or whatever. And then I realized, um, you know, you can't define me. You can't say what I am. I know what I am, uh, and that keeps me like strong. It's difficult anyway. I mean, it's work in progress. I mean, but uh, I think that that really helped me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have, uh, let's jump into one of the questions from our online uh, viewers. Okay. Uh, so we have a question here. 
uh, as a content creator, how do you come up with new content each day to not only entertain your audience, but also ensure that you touch upon social issues? Well, I, I read most of the emails people send me. Uh, and that's something that, and, and, and then I, you know, it's like depending on the, the year or the, the time, like in the world, like there are some topics that are more present than others. I mean, I mean it's something that it's like worldwide. Um, and when I start receiving a lot of emails uh, talking about the same thing, like, okay, speak about this, or I had this problem, and then I see that it's something kind of recurrent, then, okay, then I realize, okay, I can touch on this topic. I also try to, even when I'm laughing about something, like, for example, I, I create content um, based on the experiences of people. Like, people send me, like, oh, I had a bad day because this is, is and that, so I read the experience and I laugh about it. Like, oh, yeah, once I, I had the same thing with a guy, blah, blah, blah. But then I try to say something else, not only laugh, but to say, okay, like, because I think that the thing is that most of people think that we are only the ones living what we are going through. You know, like maybe oh, my dad, uh, my dad has cancer, and at the same time I, I had to uh, keep my job, and I had to go to college, and I had to pass the exams, and I had to do these three really hard things at the same time. And you think you are the only one facing that, but then when you say it publicly, there is something that like loosens up because it's like okay, yeah, we are we are all going through the same stuff. So I try to uh, to always go there. You know, so people feel kind of, I'm not alone, you know, I'm also facing this. Over there in the back. Uh, so I do stand up myself, right, and a lot of what you say, right, and I've done it quite a few times and I've kept doing it. I know every audience is different, right, so you can interact and adapt to them. But then personally, I kind of stop, you know, I stop enjoying what I've done for a while. Because I've done it so many times. So how do you keep, you know, being in love with what you've written again and again and again, so there's a fresh new feeling, space for a while, like a block in your head. You get after that. Sounds like marriage, but well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, at the beginning, I had that problem. How can I go on stage and repeat the same script like every day, every night? My thinking was, what if someone is coming again to see me? They will know that that I'm not being spontaneous. That is something that was a script and rehearsed. And then I realized, yes, of course. Like when you go to see a play like a, a, you know, a theater play, it's always the same. If you go every night, it will be always the same. People know that. And I think that the problem with that, at least in my case, was that I thought I was ripping them off. When I realized I wasn't, I don't know, then everything was okay. Of course, it took me some time because also something that happens to me is that when you repeat it so often, you stop enjoying it. So that's why I, uh, I try to, for example, I, I don't learn the script by heart. Like, it's not that I know every line. I know the topics. Like, I know I'm going to say this first, like this anecdote, this, 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 and this. I have like these bullet points. But then I don't know how I'm going to get to the next bullet point. But I know the, the, the anecdotes. So uh, that gives me the freedom to, for example, uh, come up with new jokes. I think my best jokes uh, appear on stage, not when I was rehearsing, but because I leave that freedom. Because I think that if you have everything like, script and you know exactly all the words, then you're like a robot and you don't enjoy it, of course. And people don't enjoy it either because it's like you're just repeating, it's like, uh, you know, giving a lesson. And also thinking before going on stage, these people haven't heard what I'm going to say. They have no idea, maybe one that is coming again, but I mean, most of them will not know. So for them, for me, it's repeating myself because the anecdotes are the same, but for them, it's not the same. For them, it's something new always, every night. So that's something that helped me. But anyway, it's difficult because for me, it took me like one year to adjust because I was all the time in some shows you will not enjoy and it's okay. I mean, there are a lot of shows that I don't enjoy. There are some shows that even though I'm saying all this, people don't laugh. Like I, I was touring in Europe. I was in London uh, giving a show and it was so awful. Like I, I made a video about it because nobody was laughing. It was like, God, I mean, laugh, people. <laughs> what, what, what the fuck are you doing? Like, I don't know. Um, and they wouldn't laugh. And then that also helped me as content because then I made a video. I made a video saying this. God, I feel so frustrated because nobody was laughing, and then people were saying, "Oh, uh, we, we were kind of shy," but I was. And they were. They felt so guilty. Uh, it will happen. I think that you also should relax. You know, yeah, you will not enjoy all shows. Some shows will be awful. Uh, you will forget maybe what the script, or people will just not laugh. You will feel like a failure. It's okay. I mean, it's part of the job. Like. Um, once I have a talk with a colleague of mine, because I was 
I was recording videos on YouTube and I was feeling, uh, it never happened to me, but I started feeling like this is not funny while I was recording the video, which is something so damaging. Uh, you shouldn't feel that because, I mean, nothing good will come up, uh, come up from that. And then my friend told me, it's okay to feel like that. I mean, it's part of the, of the job. It's like, I, I'm sure that singers also feel like a failure sometimes, or, or my voice is so awful, it's not, we, we all have bad days. Uh, so I think that we, you should try to, not to block that part of you, but to include it. I mean, this is you, you will feel like a failure, but we all feel like a failure sometimes, and we all have awful shows. I mean, you're, you will not be the first one and not be the last one either. So like, relax, you're welcome. Uh, you mean about being gay? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, in my case, it was pretty easy. I was accepted by my family and friends. I think I didn't accept myself at the beginning because I remember being so afraid of telling my mom I'm gay. And I remember that when I said it, she just turned around and looked at me as if I had said, I've got cancer, I'm gonna die or something. <laughs> and she told me, what? And then I thought, okay, maybe I will say something else, you know, because she didn't hear it, but then, okay, I'm gay. And it was okay, like, uh, she helped me, she said that she, she loves me, like, no matter what, that it's okay. But then I felt sad, like, because my mom was all the time saying, oh, when you have a son, I will take care of, of him and blah, blah, blah. And then I thought, okay, I'm, I'm not going to have children. I know I, I can adopt and all that, but I hate children. Um, <laughs> so it's like, um, it was harder, I think, for me. And then my friends, it was always okay, because... Argentina is pretty liberal anyway. Like we have some problems like in politics, but in that aspect, in the LGBT community, we are kind of okay. Of course, if you go to a very small town, okay, it's different. So I didn't really have problems with that. Thank you. In comedy, it's important to, uh, you know, there's a fine line between uh, what's funny and what's, you know, not right to say. Uh, so how do you, you know, walk that fine line? Uh, well, sometimes I, I step out of that line. Uh, yeah, that, that's a risk. And as a comedian, you are always making jokes that can be offensive. And some, some, some of them are, really. And you make a mistake and you have to say, sorry, I made this insensitive co uh, comment and, and it's just, you know, wrong. Uh, because the thing is, at the beginning, I think I was much freer, but because I spoke to a very small uh, viewership, it was like 1,000 per, um, per video. And they all understood, understood the jokes and that I was not talking seriously or whatever. But then when you get, you know, like many more views, it's hard. And the only way to learn what to say and what is, I mean, what, what, what's okay and what's offensive is by making mistakes. And I made a lot of mistakes and I say sorry and just go on. It's difficult anyway. I mean, I'm, I'm putting it very simply, but it's like you will get a lot of backlash. And at the beginning you will think, oh, no, no, but it, it was a joke. Like, because the problem is that Sometimes you make a joke and people take it seriously. And it's like, God, I'm joking. It's like when you watch a movie and you see an actor killing someone in the movie, it's a movie. I mean, you, will, you would never say, you're a serial killer, like to the actor. And the actor will not stop the movie and look into the camera. This is fiction. <laughs> they will not say that. I'm not a serial killer. <sighs> in the same way, me as a comedian, if I make a joke now, kind of offensive, and I say, this is a joke, it's not funny anymore. Yeah, yeah. Like, so you have to make the joke and you know, stand up for it. Yeah. It's difficult anyway, and I, I have made mistakes. Yeah, I say sorry, and, and sometimes I don't say sorry because sometimes it's like now we have, at least in Argentina, this kind of political correctness. Is that an okay term? Yeah. Uh, like all of a sudden you can't, whatever you say is offensive for whatever minority. If I know that I'm not being offensive and I know that I didn't make a mistake, I will not apologize. Because what we have now is a kind of censorship, I think, that people start attacking you on Twitter and it's so hard that people start, I mean, everybody's apologizing now. Like everybody, they make videos, even cry now, oh no, I didn't mean that. I, I mean, and it's like, oh, I also did that. There are videos of mine crying saying, I didn't mean that. <laughs> and I regret so much because of course I didn't mean that because it was a joke. But I mean, yes, I'm, but I didn't make a mistake. And he's like, maybe you take it offensive, but that's you and you should go to therapy. I don't know, or <laughs> yeah, or, or to talk with your friends about it. But it, you can't, because we all find things offensive, but you have to realize if it's a joke, okay, you, you should work on yourself. You, you shouldn't say, okay, don't do this because it's offensive. Because apart from that, it depends on the country. Like, for example, I think here in India, it's common to burp. To, uh, I think it's common, like, it's okay. Like in Argentina, for example, if you do that uh, while you're eating, 
it's, it's not good, you know. So it's a, what's offensive and what's not? I don't know. It depends on the culture. It depends on the country. So nothing is offensive. Well, some things are. But anyway, thank you. We have a question over there. We are a few questions. First question is, has anyone like compared to do like Will Smith slash Chris Rock? <laughs> so the question, question is uh, about like free speech. I know there are some controversial comedians like uh, I think uh, Faye Chappell or George Chappell or George Kahn and there's uh, an argument that, you know, a comedian should be about sensitive to the jokes, I should say, to the audience and what your opinion is on that. So uh, I think the question, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the question is about uh, how do you, how you feel about uh, like having to be sensitive to so many communities when you're uh, doing your work, and how do you you know find that balance? Am I right? Yes. Okay. And if I got ever slapped, yeah. as Chris <laughs> Rock. Yes. 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 Uh, I went through different stages about that. At the beginning, I was so free; I could say whatever, and it was okay. Then. Like one year ago, two years ago, I got like very like, okay, I will never make jokes again about uh, the gay community or whatever. They even call me homophobic. I mean, really, because I make jokes about the gay community. And it's like, God, I mean, um, so uh, it's pretty hard. And, I, and two years ago, I tried not to make any, you know, any joke that may offend someone. And then a lot of people wrote me. I mean, I got more viewers than ever, but then my, like my real fan base, you know, that of course is much less than, than the total viewers, wrote me all the time saying, eh, Martin, you are a little bit boring now. Like you were funnier before. And, and at the time I was thinking, God, but I'm trying to make like a positive impact because that's why I did it. I start, I stopped making this kind of, job, uh, of jokes because I didn't want to offend anyone. I mean, like I'm, I think I'm not a bad person, but then, I mean, I think this, that, that censorship that you cannot say anything because everybody will get offended got to a, to a certain point that was like, God, you cannot say anything because everything will be wrong and everything can be taken in a different way, you know? And then I stopped doing it and now I make, of, I, I'm like at the beginning of my career, like making awful jokes and I don't, I don't care. Like people, of course, try to cancel me or say, oh, the, uh, you cannot say this, it is awful. Like, you're laughing about people who die of, I don't know. Uh, I'm not laughing about that. I mean, and if you think that, you haven't understood the joke, and that's on you. I mean, uh, but it's like a long way. I mean, for me, it was a long way to, to get to this place. I mean, it's not easy. And at the beginning, you get afraid because you always think, okay, I'm going to lose my career. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So Thank you. Ah. <laughs> I love you, <laughs>